we have time for several questions. Mm -hmm. Do you want to jump in? Ask a question for the last speaker. I noticed that your you know your sample had people who were very or who considered themselves fairly familiar and fairly unfamiliar. And I was curious, and I know it might be just impressionistic, whether you got a sense that the ethics issues they identified were different between the groups. You know, this is what's qualitative, so it's really hard. But when we also have data from uh, the survey that we conducted, and the numbers are pretty similar, so. I think there's some consensus if either there, so that we really cannot say that there's a difference between AI experts and AI ethics experts. So they did point to some uh, similar issues. There's some evidence of convergence or something. Yeah. yeah that's so I have a question for Jordan. Just wanted to follow up on the human computer interaction and the trust question. I'm curious if you have a sense as to what's likely to promote this trust. I've heard people say the real key thing for trust is explainability, and other people say that doesn't matter at all. Explainability is totally pointless, and why would we care? Uh, that validation is what matters, that it's all about design, that we should try to figure out a way to get trust whatever the underlying uh, uh, validity is. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts. Yeah, so I think that I have two thoughts. Um, one is that the, so there's, 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 there's two challenges. There are many challenges when it comes to, to AI integration, but uh, when it comes to my talk, there are kind of two challenges that there's some tension between. Um, one is convincing clinicians that these tools are trustworthy. And the other is convincing hospital administration that these tools are valuable. Uh, and the latter tends to be a policy issue more than a, a, a empirical issue. Uh, and so I think that involving clinicians in, in the development of these tools is important and results in tools that are, are more likely to improve both patient care and uh, clinical workflows and the efficiency of these these clinical processes. Um, but I also know that if you look at uh, um, electronic health records, you know, the, the push for that integration ended up being policy. It ended up being the, the, the Medicaid um, uh, incentive program uh, that, got hospitals to do that because integrating these systems is uh i wouldn't say they're expensive but uh it requires you to, to to shut down everything and and do a whole software update and then educate everyone on the process and healthcare systems just don't accommodate that well and and that loss of time um it's a financial loss at the end of the day so i i I think that um, I certainly think that when it comes to the systems being integrated on the, the clinical level, it's important to have uh, clinician input and, and support. Um, and I'll also say that, I guess, as someone who's worked in the clinic, like, clinicians complain about things like epic all the time <laughs> and the pain point that that causes and and the like unnecessary checklists and things that you have to go to so often the hospital administration overrules that um but i i do think that um proving to hospital systems based on the incentives that they have to make changes is incredibly challenging in the modern world um, without essentially policy incentives. And it is easier if you can show clinical benefit, if you can show this will seamlessly integrate into the system, if you can show that essentially the, the you've minimized the, the time that it will require to integrate and train people to use these things because minimizing the time will minimize the cost. But those are those are uh, not necessarily separate problems, but two problems that that there's a lot of tension between that I think require different approaches.
emphasize more in the last couple of years is the idea of trustworthy governance instead of just trustworthy systems. We have this idea of like, well, the systems have the right parameters, like then we can, then the public will adopt them. But do we have, you know, the, the education, infrastructure in the hospitals, the remediation, all these kinds of things that make us like, okay, people have at least thought about this uh, more fully. So actually, I have a question that dovetails really nicely with that, both for you, Daniel, and for Jordan, I think. Um, so when you're raising the example of deep fakes and what, what we can learn from deep fakes was very provocative for me. And one thing that I was thinking about is how one of the sort of the main takeaways, I think, from a lot of the deep fakes discourse over the last several years is precisely what you were just pointing to, which is that the problems with deep fakes are less about one particular deep fake emerging and the effects it has on people, but rather the effects of deep fakes on like the broader information environment. And so I'm wondering if there are parallels between that and worries about um, maybe synthetic data specifically or like AI failure generally. Um, and so I wonder that from you and then also Jordan, you're, you're thinking about sort of like the clinical space and, and like AI failures, if there are knock on effects from the failure of something like Watson on how folks in the clinic think about other potential useful AI tools or things like that. I think that's, that's totally right. Um, a lot of the initial research, much of the initial research for a while was just direct persuasive effects of deep fakes. So like, do people believe them or not? Do they seem real or not? And a bunch of studies kind of showing, you know, coin flip uh, uh, beliefs from people. Um, and something that I tried to emphasize was these sort of second order or indirect effects, these things like uh, decreasing trust in institutions, the you know, information apocalypse how even the allegation of a deep fake can cause these kinds of problems, whether or not something is actually a deep fake. Uh, so I think uh, this, this could play out systemically in synthetic data context also, where uh, some of the things we've talked about in this group are, you know, for example, uh, if synthetic data is cheaper, are we gonna start using synthetic data when we should be collecting primary data? Are we gonna be collecting synthetic data for exactly the kinds of groups of people who are high risk, where we wouldn't collect those data normally because it's not profitable? So all sorts of ways that it could spill out and, and then lead to these groups, you know, lacking trust or having worse health outcomes or at least comparatively worse health outcomes. There we go. Um, to speak to my experience with the healthcare system uh, on this topic, I think that there is, I think that there's the challenge of, of integrating AI related systems um, and what comes with that and the the specific ways that that clinicians who have been part of these tests um, have been burned uh, uh, by that process. I do also think that there's almost uh, uh, not even almost I think there's like a meta level problem of the the medical the, the healthcare system in the US um, and and the kind of pharmaceutical and like medical tools sales process often being banked on a lot of like snake oil. <laughs> and so I don't blame them for not trusting these systems because even before AI, you look at um, the way that, uh, uh, if we're taking the FDA, for example, the way that the FDA uh, uh, runs trials and and approves things for clinical use were were often people talk about you know this thing was uh, approved in a clinical trial the trial was successful um often the trial that was conducted uh is a non-inferiority trial so it's a trial that says that this is not worse than what we currently do and that's not compelling from a clinical perspective in terms of should we integrate this into practice unless there are other aspects of that non-inferiority that are better for clinical workflows? Um, and in the AI sense, it's often a coin flip. And so I think that um, there are certainly trust issues when it comes to AI tools um, these days as it relates to clinicians. But I also think that like the way that we decide what tools should enter the clinic is not typically based on, or not purely based on like optimizing patient care, optimizing clinician workflow. <laughs> it's It's more based on like, saving hospital systems money and and optimizing that side of things and that's just 
I prefer that we didn't do it that way, but that's how the system is. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Um, any last minute burning questions? Have time maybe for one more. Okay, in that case, uh, let's thank our panelists. Well, that went fast. <laughs> um, thank you all for these really fantastic talks. I'm sorry I missed the very last ones, but Sovia, we do have a really um, fantastic spread of food next door for us, so we'll have lunch. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for joining us online, and hopefully we'll continue these conversations uh, throughout the afternoon. Thanks. Thank you.